Hey, everybody, and welcome back to our Topics in Neuro Rehabilitation webcast. I'm Jill Butler, and today we're going to be talking with Ariel Resnick. Ariel is a 2010 graduate of Rutgers University and was the pilot neuro resident at Kessler Institute in 2011. She is now an advanced clinical specialist at Kessler, as well as the program director for the neuro residency. Ariel is currently serving as a clinical content expert to the ABPTS's Neurologic Specialty Council. She's also an adjunct instructor at Rutgers University and Seton Hall University, teaching courses and guest lecturing in neurologic rehabilitation, motor learning and control, pathophysiology, and clinical inquiry. Most recently, Ariel became a development group member for the World Health Organization's Package of Rehabilitation Interventions for Traumatic Brain Injury as part of the Rehabilitation 2030 Initiative. Ariel's primary research interests are in outcome measures and rehabilitation technology. Ariel, it's so exciting to have you with us here today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. Um, so what Ariel's going to be talking to us about today is cardiovascular fitness and health behavior change for individuals post-stroke. This is a hugely important topic, and we're really excited to hear what you have to say about it. So I'm going to let you go ahead and take it from here. Great. Thanks so much. So as Jill mentioned, we're going to chat a little bit about overall cardiovascular fitness um, and health behavior change in individuals, specifically post-stroke. Um, what I think is really important for specifically in this population is we always think of stroke as a brain condition, but truly it's a cardiovascular condition that affects the brain. And by that, you know, affecting the brain, then it affects the whole body. Um, so where I want to start is just some definitions about health, wellness, fitness, exercise versus physical activity. Um, spend a little bit of time talking about the status of health and wellness in both disabled and non-disabled individuals in the U.S. as well as worldwide. Um, look at a model of health behavior change, particularly the trans-theoretical model um, and how it pertains to exercise, um, along with barriers and facilitators to implementing exercise and, and physical activity changes in individuals. And then finally, we'll chat a little bit about cardiovascular exercise prescription for individuals post-stroke and why it is so important to be individualized um, when we take that approach with our patients and clients. So starting out, definitions for health and wellness. I really love what the WHO said in 1940 um, as far as a definition for health, um, stating that a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. And why I like this definition so much and why I think it's so important is that in a lot of our patients, they think that once they have a presence of some sort of you know, neurological disorder, any sort of disability, it kind of precludes them from ever being considered healthy again. Um, and what I think is so important about that is we need to kind of instill in our patients and our clients that just because they've had this neurological injury or, you know, whatever disability they may have as a result of that, it doesn't mean that they can never be considered healthy again, or that they can ever feel healthy again. And then when we look at the definitions for wellness, uh, the guide to PT practice said it really well in 2016, that wellness is a state of being that incorporates all facets and dimensions of human existence, including physical health, emotional health, spirituality, and social connectivity. And I think this has become even more starkly highlighted um, in sort of our pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic world when we think about the lack of social connectivity, um, the overwhelming sort of neglect for both physical and emotional health that happened during the pandemic and during quarantine, um, just sort of highlighting how important it really is for all individuals and not just for individuals with disabilities. And then finally, a definition for fitness. It is a dynamic physical state comprising cardiovascular and pulmonary endurance, muscle strength, power, endurance, and flexibility, relaxation, and body composition, all of which combine to allow optimal and efficient performance of daily and leisure activities. And what I mostly want to call your attention to within this definition is that fitness is a dynamic physical state. So on any given day, week, month, year, we may be more or less physically fit than we were before. Um, and sort of reminding our patients that whatever fitness level they're currently at now doesn't have to stay that way forever, um, even in spite of whatever, you know, mobility, cognitive communication challenge they may be experiencing as a result of their neurologic injury, that there is the ability to move both higher and lower sort of on the fitness continuum and realizing how important that is. 
When we look at defining physical activity versus exercise, really the main difference is that exercise is truly planned, structured, and repetitive bodily movement. It's extremely positively correlated with physical fitness um, and results usually in some form of energy expenditure can range from low to high. Um, and the objective is really to both either improve or maintain physical fitness. Whereas physical activity doesn't have to be planned or structured. It can be things like going out for a walk. Um, and it's also positively correlated with physical fitness, but not as positively correlated as structured exercise is. Some physical activity facts, um, specifically focusing on the US, um, and these may be staggering, even as a PT, I remember you know, feeling sort of shocked when I saw this. Um, less than 5% of adults participate in 30 minutes of physical activity each day. When we look at the amount of physical activity that people are getting per week, only one in three adults achieve the recommended amount every week. And when we compare individuals with a disability to individuals without a disability, basically double the amount of people that have a disability report being physically inactive during a usual week compared to those without a disability. So the addition of a disability, you know, we're as a culture pretty physically inactive to begin with, and then with the addition of a disability, even more physically inactive. Moving to a more, you know, worldwide view, Every year, at least 1.9 million people die as a result of physical inactivity, and it's been categorized as the fourth leading cause of death. Um, and more than 35 million people die every year of non-communicable diseases, which represents 60% of all deaths worldwide. Um, and a non-communicable disease is defined as a medical condition or disease that's by definition non-infectious and non-transmissible among people. So these are things like high blood pressure, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and pulmonary diseases. And when we look at the treatment for a lot of these non-communicable diseases, it's found that at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on five out of seven days of the week actually reduces an individual's risk of contracting several of the, these common non-communicable diseases. What that really amounts to is 150 minutes of physical activity per week. And what I think is really important to highlight here is that the latest guidelines say that you can accumulate these 150 minutes in any size bout. I think, you know, there was a push in kind of the early 2000s that said, you know, if you can't commit to at least a 30 minute bout of exercise, you might as well not exercise at all. Um, and I think people realized how powerful those words are and how much that was actually contributing to even more inactivity in individuals. Um, so now really, even if you can only tolerate bouts of two minutes of physical activity at a time, as long as it adds up to that 30 minutes a day or 150 minutes a week, any size bout is being shown to be effective. So for an individual who says, you know, I don't have enough time in my workday to participate in physical activity, even if you're able to stand up from your desk and walk around your office for five minutes and you do that eight times in a day, there's, you know, 40 minutes of physical activity that you're participating in on that day. When we look at the overall health of people in America, and I should also say, all of these stats are pre-COVID, um, so things may be different now, um, but just on the whole, um, at any given time, less than 5% of Americans engage in 150 minutes of physical activity every week. Less than 5% of Americans consume a healthy diet and maintain a healthy body weight, and less than 5% of Americans do not smoke overall. Only 35 to 44% of adults 75 or older are physically active and 28 to 34% of adults 65 to 74 are physically active according to the CDC. And then, you know, I think most of us are acutely aware of this, but 70% of Americans don't get the recommended hours of sleep per night, which is seven and a half hours. I can't remember the last time I got seven and a half hours of sleep. Um, but in general, PTs is, you know, by background are experts in physical exercise. We are more than capable of developing individualized plans for people to participate in physical activity, um, especially for individuals who are overweight or obese in order to help manage weight and prevent the development of obesity or combat its effects. So really important. These are some infographics from the CDC um, that I just think really highlight um, 
the percentage of people that have a disability and how that disability relates to their overall health. Um, so 26% or one in four adults in the US have some type of disability and disabilities are divided up into one of six categories, uh, a mobility disability, uh, disability in cognition, disability in the uh, ability to live independently. It could be a hearing disability, vision disability or a self-care disability. Um, and when we look at how that correlates to their health, these adults that are living with disabilities are more likely to be obese, they're more likely to smoke, more likely to have heart disease, and more likely to have diabetes. And then when we take it a step further and look at physical activity relative to type of disability, not surprising that individuals who have a mobility deficit, um, which is defined as having serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs, 57% of individuals with a mobility deficit get no physical, no aerobic physical activity, um, followed by 40% of individuals with a cognitive deficit, 36% of those with a vision deficit, 33% with a hearing deficit, and compared to 26% who have no disability as far as getting no physical activity in a given week or no aerobic physical activity. Individuals with disabilities are three times more likely to have heart disease, stroke, diabetes, or cancer than adults with disabilities. And we can kind of directly attribute this to a lack of physical activity. Um, and nearly half of all adults with disabilities get no physical activity at all, um, which is obviously an important health behavior to help avoid some of these chronic diseases. And this last stat, which I find really interesting, is that adults with disabilities were 82% more likely to be physically active if their doctor recommended it. And so where that kind of leaves room for us is, you know, making ourselves better known as the physical activity experts. Um, I think, you know, a lot of doctors know what we do and they know how important what we do is, but they don't necessarily consider referring their patients to us if they don't have a strict mobility deficit. Um, and really, you know, regardless of whether it is a mobility deficit, if it's a cognitive deficit, if it's a visual deficit, a hearing deficit, there are still physical therapy related goals that we can set for people and really help develop plans for them that would allow them to not only start, but to adhere to some sort of physical activity or exercise plan. When we then look at taking it uh, more stroke specific, there was data that was collected from the Framingham study that showed that after age 55, one in five women and one in six men will have a stroke. Um, which is a pretty staggering statistic when you think about it. Um, and really the key contributor to increased stroke risk is having a blood pressure that's greater than 140 over 90. And what I think is such a powerful statistic here is that the lifetime risk of having a stroke actually decreases by half in both men and women if BP is maintained below 120 over 80. And one of the biggest obstacles to that is two thirds of cases of hypertension are either undetected or inadequately managed. Um, so there are, you know, are people who are not necessarily, they've been diagnosed as hypertensive and they're not compliant with medications, or they just don't have the access to a physician to appropriately manage their hypertension, even if it's been diagnosed. What's also really important to note is that after a stroke, there's a 13% risk of subsequent stroke within one year following the initial stroke and a 25 to 33% risk after five years. So when it comes to engaging physical in physical activity after a stroke, we really can reduce stroke risk by helping reduce blood pressure through physical activity. So there was a meeting uh, in 2017 with the APTA um, that was sort of just a call to action to all PTs in all realms. Um, and what I thought was one of the powerful quotes that came out of this meeting was from Gail Jensen. Um, and she basically said, individual therapists and the, prevent and the profession must fully commit to eliminate health disparities, address the social determinants of health and improve the healthcare, health and well-being of our communities and promote the health of populations. So we really need to work on empowering ourselves as again, mobility experts, people who are able to restore health and well-being in our patients and our clients. I want to briefly talk about two papers that I think bring to light some of what we're talking about and kind of talk about our role in physical activity that goes beyond sort of the traditional PT model, um, or at least the current model of care. Um, so this article came out in 2018 by Wingo and Rimmer um, about different trends in people with disabilities. And this, you know, through the lifespan um, both congenital and non-congenital um, acquired neurologic di uh, disabilities. Um, and what they found is that there really needs to be a balance between reactive and anticipatory care. 
And what's difficult with that, particularly in our current healthcare model in this country, is that the access to anticipatory care is really not there. Um, it is difficult in most states to see a PT without already having some sort of diagnosis or referral from a physician, unless you're in a direct access state. Um, so we live in a very reactive healthcare model. And if we, you know, can be leaders and trailblazers in our field, we may be able to move people towards more of that anticipatory model of care. Beyond that, there also is a need for enabling environments within communities to make things both physically accessible as well as financially accessible for individuals when it comes to health and wellness and physical activity. There needs to be a special emphasis to provide support to patients and or to parents and caregivers to promote that behavior change in their loved ones and kind of help illustrate the importance of physical activity and lifelong adherence. And then overall, a call for a paradigm shift just in the way that we are able to address clients, meet clients where they are, um, again, along on that pathway of to fitness and well-being. And then this other paper I thought was really interesting, talking about rebranding exercise um, and using sort of values-based goal setting. Um, and what I think is really important to note here is what they were finding in this is that goals have to be based in quality of life in order to improve adherence to exercise plans. When we make goals that are sort of broadly health related, it can be really broad and hard to grasp for individuals, but having a better daily life is something that they can immediately see and feel. So an example of that, you know, if you're somebody who's either had a stroke or, you know, has some sort of mobility deficit, but also has high blood pressure, if you're told that exercise is going to lower your blood pressure, but you've been exercising for three weeks and your blood pressure hasn't, you know, dropped into the normal range, you might be frustrated and not see that that exercise is actually, or that physical activity or exercise is actually, you know, benefiting your health. But if you have a goal that's based on quality of life, you may, you know, be this individual who also has knee pain that prohibited them from getting down on getting down on the floor to play with your grandkids. And you could see after the three weeks of exercise, you were now able to get down on the floor and play with your grandkids without your knee hurting you. So it's much more immediate. It's much more rewarding to have goals that are based in quality of life. They feel more achievable. They're, you know, much more better understood by patients. Um, you know, things like improving strength by one MMT grade, um, again, you know, lowering your systolic blood pressure by 10 points. Those are less tangible um, and less immediate for patients um, and clients. So kind of feeling that immediate connection to exercise, making you better or making your day-to-day -day life better is really key. So we'll move now to talking about health behavior change um, and using the trans theoretical model um, and applying it to exercise. And the trans theoretical model was, you know, from the psychology world and it was really born out of techniques for smoking cessation for individuals. Um, but it is really easily applicable to exercise. So instead of trying to cease a behavior, you're trying to start a behavior. Um, the Exercises Medicine website, which I highly recommend for all things exercise, um, just nicely kind of came up with this algorithm that would help you as an individual practitioner assess where your patient or client is in terms of wanting to become physically active. So asking the question, are you regularly physically active? Yes or no. Um, if they're not, it's basically looking at, do you intend to start in the next 30 days or in the next six months? And if you're planning to start in the next 30 days, you're considered to be in the preparation phase. If you're not intending to start in 30 days, but you might be intending to start in the next six months, then you're in the contemplation phase. If you're not even attempting to or intending to start in the next six months, you'd be considered in the pre-contemplation pre phase. Um, for individuals who have been regularly physically active, if they haven't been doing it for more than six months, they're considered to be in the action phase. And if they've been doing it for more than six months, they're considered to be in the maintenance phase. Um, and just a note there that for activity to be considered regular, it has to add up to more than or a total of 30 minutes or more per day for that five days per week to get that total of 150 minutes per week. So when we look at applying the stages of change to exercise and physical activity, what I think is most important in the way that we educate our patients and clients is that, you know, on the whole, do no harm. We have to meet patients where they are. Um, and part of that is gonna involve presenting health promotion and wellness to our patients in a really non-threatening way. Um, keeping in mind that not all patients conceptualize health and wellness through the same lens as we do as mobility experts. So we really have to recognize when there are issues, help 
you know, once the barriers are identified, help them kind of overcome those barriers and really figuring out where health and wellness fits into their individual values. There are tons of people who will tell you, I just don't like to exercise. They conceptualize exercise as running on a treadmill, um, running on a track, you know, as activities that are inherently not enjoyable to them. Um, so making individuals understand that really just getting your heart rate up, however you feel best, whether it's dancing, um, you know, riding a bike, whatever makes them feel good contributes to those minutes and those minutes add up. Um, and when they start to feel the benefit of that, or they're telling you, you know, we've identified that riding my bike is what I find enjoyable, but I have knee pain when I ride my bike. Okay, great. We've established that this is a barrier for you. We can work on what's the cause of the knee pain. How do we, you know, ameliorate that knee pain and all of that. Um, so this trans theoretical model, you know, just gives you good information um, and a good framework for when to give certain types of cues, when to give assistance, when to back off, um, and really just, again, how to meet patients where they are. Some of the perceived barriers to physical fitness and wellness, more on the, the patient end of things, really at the top of the list is going to be access for your individuals with disabilities, particularly individuals with a mobility deficit. Um, whether or not they have transportation to a fitness center, um, and then if they have transportation to a fitness center, is the fitness center itself accessible to an individual who might have a mobility challenge, whether that means they're in a wheelchair or they need a walker, cane, some sort of assistive device. Time is another big one. Um, you know, I think it's easy for patients and clients to carve out time for physical therapy because that doesn't necessarily feel optional. Um, but after discharge, they, you know, kind of are, you know, on their own now in the community and they're kind of like, well, what next? You know, I, I was dedicating 45 minutes, three times a week to physical therapy, but now I'm back to work. Now I'm doing X, Y, or Z thing. I'm chasing around my kids. I don't have the time. Then the mobility impairments themselves are also a huge barrier. Um, any cognitive or communication impairments, um, these in particular, you know, even beyond a mobility challenge for an individual who's trying to exercise in some sort of community fitness program, if they don't feel like they're safe enough to make their needs known in that setting, a lot of times they consider that their hugest barrier and they're not gonna be willing to put themselves in a situation where they're not able to communicate their needs. And then any other comorbidities that they may have, they may have pre-existing severe knee osteoarthritis, and maybe they were, you know, a couple months away from getting a knee replacement when they had their stroke. Um, and now maybe, you know, they have to delay that knee replacement. So they're limited by just pre-existing pain um, that was not, you know, as a result of uh, their neurologic injury. Looking at general lack of access to physical fitness within fitness centers, um, I thought this was really interesting. Um, basically, they surveyed multiple different um, fitness centers to look at overall accessibility, and almost none of them met accessibility requirements in all of these domains. So do they have access routes and entrance areas? things like locker rooms and showers, even just information and signage. And when you go to sign in, if you're an individual in a wheelchair and the reception desk is high up, do they even see that you've entered the building and are they you know, willing and able to help you? Um, for facilities that had a swimming pool, most didn't have an accessible swimming pool where there would be you know, some sort of mechanical lift to assist patients in and out of the pool. Um, even things that you wouldn't necessarily think about, like water fountains, can they access um, water when they're exercising? Um, so really taking into account that from a physical perspective, um, just because they're able to, you know, wheel themselves or, or move themselves into the fitness center, that doesn't necessarily mean that the equipment is accessible for them or that, you know, it's easy enough for them to access what they need to access within a gym. So where we come in, um, again, is looking at changing the overall patient client mindset. And I think overall, you know, we've all worked with patients who are kind of like, you know, once PT ends, you know, you must be discharging me for a reason. That means I've hit my maximum recovery and I'm not going to continue to get better. Um, so it's really our job to indicate that there is sort of a, a line where skilled physical therapy is no longer needed, but physical activity is a lifelong, you know, commitment. Um, so we need to do a really good job of preparing our patients to sort of leave our PT nest and fly. When we look at barriers in neurologic health conditions, um, I think it's important to talk about barriers 
in the through the lens of the ICF model, I think it's really helpful to conceptualize that way. So when we look at the body structure and function level um, and how it causes barriers specifically to health and wellness, um, just the symptoms of the actual condition. So is there spasticity after a stroke? Is there a loss of range of motion, a loss of strength? Um, what's the chronicity? How long are they post-stroke? Um, are they somebody who's, you know, 10 years post-stroke and just trying to get back to health and wellness after kind of a 10 year break from exercise? Do they have any secondary conditions such as osteoarthritis, um, even something like advanced diabetes, we don't necessarily think of, uh, or we, you know, recognize it as a comorbidity, but but thinking about issues like retinopathy and helping an individual choose exercises um, that are not going to, you know, put their eyesight at risk. So, you know, pounding on a treadmill is probably not advisable for somebody who has advanced diabetes and retinopathy. Then looking at the activity level, just overall decreased mobility or difficulty with ADLs. At the participation level, there may be that, that concept of just disappointment or embarrassment in participation because they're not moving the same way that they were moving before or moving the same way that others move. Um, they're not able to communicate the same way that they were able to communicate before. From um, a personal um, and, and sometimes even an environmental standpoint too, individuals might have fluctuating fatigue. Um, a fear of falling is also huge, you know, and the ability to feel like you can safely be out in the community, let alone exercising, um, is often um, a complaint or a barrier for individuals post-stroke. Things like general weakness, pain and stiffness, any bladder or bowel issues, um, things that make people avoid public settings in general. Um, depending on the injury, not so much for stroke, but uh, more with spinal cord injury issues with thermoregulation. Are they, you know, safe to exercise for those, you know, sort of higher level cervical injuries where they can't sweat below their level of injury? Um, what's the implication of that? They might be afraid of injuring themselves. There may be cognitive or communication changes that again, prevent them from being able to make their needs known. And then apathy um, from a neurologic perspective, not even necessarily from a behavioral perspective is a huge thing to consider. And then environmentally, we kind of divide this up between the physical environment and the social environment. With the physical environment, um, as we mentioned before, just lack of accessible transport, difficulty accessing services within recreational facilities. So they may be an individual who'd like to choose aquatics as their mode of exercise that they're most interested in. But if they don't have a pool that's accessible for them, if they have a significant mobility deficit for getting safely in and out of the pool, that's going to be a huge barrier for them. Um, limited suitable or convenient programs, the cost of programs, because again, most of this stuff um, in the health and wellness end of things is not covered by insurance. Um, and then lack of suitable equipment or training once they're in a fitness center. Do they feel like there's a trainer there that knows anything about stroke that would be able to take their blood pressure if they felt like off or if they felt like something was wrong? And then socially, a lack of expectations from others to be active. Um, this is a complaint that I hear from patients a lot um, that essentially once they've had a stroke, their family members and friends, you know, view them as disabled and therefore separate from the exercise and fitness world. They, they can't participate or they don't expect them to participate. Insufficient support from facility staff. So, you know, whether it's purposeful or not, if there is just a general lack of knowledge of, you know, what to do or how to train somebody who has had a stroke and they, you know, have some residual hemiparesis or whatever the case may be. Poor social attitudes from others and then lack of encouragement or knowledge from healthcare professionals. So if their doctors um, aren't encouraging them to participate in physical activity as a means of improving or maintaining their health, that's a big barrier. Other attributes um, on the personal level of things, having age that's increasing, maybe there's unemployment that was experienced as a result of their disability. Um, and then they're just general beliefs, lack of belief or interest in exercise, which may have been pre-morbid um, and now is exacerbated by the fact that there's a mobility or cognitive challenge, decreased self-efficacy for exercise, again, that perceived lack of time and other responsibilities, misunderstanding of what constitutes beneficial exercise. So maybe they feel, you know, just kind of lost in a gym setting. They don't really know what to do or what's going to be beneficial for them. That lack of motivation, feeling self-conscious or embarrassed in public and feeling anxious, frustrated, or angry. So we spent a few minutes talking about the barriers and it's important to also talk about the facilitators because that is where we as healthcare professionals, um, and this is really multidisciplinary, PT, OT, um, physical medicine and rehab, where we kind of all can come together to promote 
physical activity and exercise in our, in, in our patients and clients. Um, so at the activity level, encouraging individuals to participate in physical exercise because it allows them to maintain their independence, um, because it helps with their overall functional level um, and management of their weight, and because it prevents secondary conditions. So, you know, if they are diabetic or they have high blood pressure, um, making sure to kind of thoroughly explain the risks of having a second stroke as a result of those comorbid conditions, but that you can reduce blood sugar, you can reduce blood pressure um, just by participating in regular physical activity and exercise. Personal factors, um, trying to encourage the you know, sense of achievement that you get from setting and achieving a goal, um, the overall enjoyment um, and, and kind of just feeling good as a result of the endorphins that you get from exercise, it can make people feel really normal um, in sort of you know, a world where they've been thrust into feeling out of control of their lives. Exercise is something that they can control. Um, overall motivation and optimism and helping to kind of redefine themselves um, and kind of escape from the everyday living with their disability. Environmentally, we can do a lot to advocate for accessible facilities um, and, you know, volunteering to educate trainers who are willing to kind of take on that knowledge or even recommending some medical fitness certifications for individuals who are interested in training individuals post-stroke, um, promoting sufficient social support, um, yeah, uh, so we'll change gears now into exercise testing and prescription um, and kind of talk about how the individualization of a program is super important for individuals post-stroke and really for all of us in general, um, but also some parameters that have to be specifically looked at in individuals post-stroke, particularly because, as we mentioned in the beginning, even though a stroke affects the brain, it's still a cardiovascular issue. So individuals who have had strokes are automatically classified as having cardiovascular disease. So all of the things that go along with that as far as exercise testing and prescription are really important for these individuals. Just some humor here. Um, exercise as the real poly pill to prevent a heart attack, take one aspirin every day, take it out for a run, then take it to the gym, then take it for a bike ride. Um, and then this quote, uh, which is quite old at this point, 1984, William Roberts, who is the editor for the American Journal of Cardiology, um, when asked, is exercise medicine? He said, it's been reported that exercise is an intervention with lipid lowering, antihypertensive, positive inotropic, negative chronotropic, vasodilating, diuretic, anorexigenic, weight reducing, cathartic, hypoglycemic, tranquilizing, hypnotic, and antidepressive qualities. And it also prevents osteoporosis and 14 types of cancer. Um, so it really and truly is medicine. It's prescribable. It's something that, you know, affects every single body system um, and does everything to kind of have a positive effect on the individual, regardless of what their health history is. When we look at exercise in neurologic rehab, there are some pretty common barriers um, the first really is uncertainty on the part of practitioners, um, even, you know, individuals who have DPTs who are trained in medical screening, um, who are trained in exercise physiology, there can be a lot of uncertainty as far as, uh, excuse me, how often should individuals be exercising, how much, how long, what type, how do I keep my patient or client safe during their exercise participation? Um, how can I best monitor their physiologic responses, heart rate, blood pressure? What if they're on X, Y, and Z medication? Um, what is the best way to keep a patient safe? Um, and overall, we need to look at implementing a more evidence-based approach. We can do things like screening to ensure safety for aerobic exercise. Um, we can do, you know, exercise testing before we prescribe anything and then truly giving the patient an actual prescription for what it is that we want them to do, how hard we want them to feel like they're working, um, what settings they should feel safe exercising in, um, giving them information that, you know, we only want you to do X, Y, and Z exercise when there's a caregiver present. Um, and then realizing that there are always going to be gaps and transitions of care. So the time between somebody discharging from traditional therapy, so say they, you know, they've gone through the continuum, they started in acute rehab, they went to either subacute or home, they did outpatient, and now they're being discharged to the community. What does that discharge look like? Are we, you know, leaving them off with, you know, sort of a generic home exercise program and saying, you know, go out in the world and fly, or are we doing things that help give them resources within their community based on resources that we know exist? You know, oh, you know, you live here, there's a, a facility two miles from your house that has X, Y, or Z program. 
and kind of helping to bridge that gap for these individuals. Taking something as simple as steps per day into account, um, looking kind of across the literature, and again, some of these stats are a little bit older, um, but when we look at individuals without physical limitation and the number of steps that people take per day, taking less than 5,000 steps per day puts you in the sedentary category, 5,000 to 7,499 is low active, 7,500 to 9,999 somewhat active, greater than 10,000 is active, and greater than 12,500 is highly active. And then when we look at the literature for individuals with different neurologic conditions, and obviously for the purpose of this talk, we're highlighting CVA, um, the mean amount of steps that an individual post-stroke is getting per day is 4,078 compared to a healthy control um, who were getting 8,338 steps per day. So your average steps per day for the individual post-stroke puts them in the sedentary category, whereas the healthy controls were in that somewhat active category. Um, Similarly, you know, when you look at other diagnoses in individuals with MS, they were taking some, you know, slightly more steps. Um, but then in, this was only for individuals who had MS but were relapse free. So they were sort of able to participate in more physical activity. But again, they're still in that very low active uh, category. Same with individuals with PD. Um, they took, you know, slightly less steps per day than individuals with Parkinson's and then incomplete SCI, again, not knowing the percentage of people that are community ambulators in that category um, had the lowest amount of steps per day. So when we look at exercise prescription, particularly for individuals post-stroke, what we do know is that it has to be multidimensional. Um, so it has to cross multiple systems. We wanna target the aerobic system. We wanna target muscle strengthening through resistance training, look at flexibility and posture, and then also incorporate neuromotor training. When it comes to assessing cardiorespiratory fitness, the peak exercise test is really the gold standard, um, but deciding as a PT who's treating a patient clinically versus in a lab um, or you know, some other setting where there's exercise physiologists, there is sort of that to test or not to test question. Um, it is recommended before exercise um, or before exercise prescription, unless the patient is walking or exercising safely at less than 40% of their heart rate reserve. Um, so when it comes to recommending high intensity exercise, um, an exercise test is really important. It doesn't necessarily have to be a peak exercise test. There are submax testing uh, protocols that will give you similar information. Um, but what we find most people do clinically is more functional testing, things like a six minute walk um, that's quick, it's easy to administer. There are norm values. Um, it helps us at least gauge safety for endurance training. Um, and then a submaximal test will give you slightly more information than functional testing, but truly peak exercise testing is the gold standard. Healthcare professionals in general tend to underutilize aerobic exercise, particularly in neurorehabilitation. Um, when we look at the utility or the utilization of aerobic exercise in neurorehab, 88% of practitioners agreed that aerobic exercise is important, but only 77% of those uh, individuals actually prescribed exercise. Um, and when they did prescribe that exercise, most just use the health record and patient response, and only 2% actually use an exercise test to guide prescription. Um, so in the stroke population, you can see why that might be problematic when we're not taking an individual's medications into account. Um, what was their health status prior? Um, what are they doing in sort of that bridge between outpatient therapy and, and trying to get back to overall physical activity within the community? If there is kind of a long gap between when therapy ended and when they're undertaking um, a physical activity program, things may have changed dramatically in their activity levels in that time period. So they may be significantly less physically fit than when they were discharged from skilled physical therapy. So the need for testing is even more important in that situation. When it comes to prescribing aerobic exercise, the generally recommended frequency is three to five days per week with activity on some, you know, some form of aerobic activity on most days per week. From an intensity perspective, we'd be looking at 40 to 70 percent, 40 to 75 percent of the VO2 peak. Um, we would want to take heart rate and RPE into account. Um, heart rate obviously becomes a much less predictable variable if the individual is on beta blockers. Um, and then from a time perspective, looking at targeting 20 to 60 minutes per day um, or multiple 10 minute sessions. And then really, you know, one of the most 
difficult parts is choosing what type of aerobic exercise. And a lot of that needs to be patient driven. Um, there's been a lot of literature recently that looked at the difference between voluntary and forced exercise, and not only from an adherence perspective, but from an actual physiological benefit, it was shown not so much in the stroke population. I don't know how much that's been studied, but in the Parkinson's population, if the individual chose the mode of aerobic exercise, not only was the adherence better, but the actual outcomes were better as well. Um, they became more physically fit if they had chosen the mode of exercise um, that they were going to be doing. For strength and resistance training, frequency is a minimum of two non-consecutive days per week. Um, so overall, if we're building sort of a weekly exercise plan, we may want to choose to do the aerobic exercise on days that we're not doing resistance training. Um, from an intensity perspective, one set of eight to 12 reps for healthy adults, 10 to 15 reps for older frail individuals, eight to 10 different exercises should be performed that target all muscle groups. Um, and again, you, this I hope goes without saying that obviously we want to pay special attention to the hemiparetic side, but also not neglect the strong side. So it, we should never be recommending unilateral strength training. We want to target improving functional mobility, consider training for increased power um, and mediating rapid balance responses. So some of those more reactive balance techniques that you can focus on in some of more of those power lifts. For postural muscles, we want to focus on muscular endurance. Um, and what we know about resistance training is that it improves overall body composition. It helps regulate glucose levels and insulin sensitivity. It can help lower blood pressure, um, decrease metabolic syndrome, decrease the risk of osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, as well as combat depression and age-related sarcopenia. There is a very strong correlation between muscle strength and functional deficits post-CVA. So task-based training is going to be really important when it comes to developing a resistance training plan. So things like step-ups, stairs, um, upper extremity tasks for ADLs that are, are more repetitive, um, these can all count towards um, functional, muscle uh, functional muscle strengthening. We want to avoid creating muscle imbalances across a joint, um, keeping in mind that newer evidence, or there really is no evidence that strengthening program uh, programs will lead to isolated movement patterns. But I think, you know, one of the, the limitations previously before some of the newer literature came out is worried, worrying that strength training, um, particularly of a muscle that has spasticity is going to increase that spasticity. And there's no evidence that that's true. Um, there really is no definitive guidance available for unilateral versus bilateral training. Um, but again, when you consider how it relates to function, there are a lot of tasks that are done by manually. So we want to want to focus on, on keeping both sides strong. Um, there is some evidence that shows that functional mobility improves with strength training, even in those individuals that have spasticity. And then from a prescription standpoint, we want to make sure that individuals are resting two to three minutes between each set of reps and maintaining at least 48 hours between sessions for any single muscle group. So really planning out what specific exercises the individual should do each day. These are just some examples of different adaptive equipment um, that what we can do as PTs is advocate for the presence of these adaptive equipment in local gyms. Most of these are not costly. They look at, you know, sort of helping a weak foot stay on a bike pedal. Um, if a person has decreased hand function, we can, you know, have a strap that attaches to their wrist so that they can utilize an upper extremity uh, machine. Um, things like cuffs and hooks, different gloves. There are lots of um, sort of cost-effective adapt ad adaptations that we can provide for individuals. When we look at flexibility and posture, frequency greater than or equal to two to three days per week of stretching the major muscle groups, uh, but really the most gains that we see in terms of flexibility will be attained if it's done daily. From an intensity perspective, we want to instruct individuals or their caregivers to stretch to the point of slight discomfort or feeling of tightness in the muscle, um, but not beyond that. Uh, stretches should be held for 30 to 60 seconds for older people, 10 to 30 seconds for most adults. PNF stretches are also um, a good way to, to promote muscle lengthening, um, three to six seconds of muscle contraction at 20 to 75% of max intensity, and then 10 to 30 seconds of assisted stretch. Uh, when it comes to the pattern, two to four repetitions of each stretch is advocated. 
Um, and then from a volume perspective, providing a total of 60 seconds of stretching time per target muscle group for any stretching method that's uh, utilized. The last category is neuromotor training. Um, and this is kind of broad um, and rightfully so. So really anything that incorporates balance and postural control falls under the neuromotor training realm. Um, so things like recommending Tai Chi, any sort of standing exercise group or seated yoga, this can be aquatic therapy. Um, so, you know, we can do things on land, we can do things in water, things that truly engage postural control as well as anticipatory and reactive balance, um, which, you know, can be at the patient, you know, whatever the patient finds enjoyable. So if they had a Tai Chi practice premorbidly, if they had a yoga practice premorbidly, um, just giving them different adaptations that would allow them to still participate in that safely. Looking at things like sensory motor agility training and ballistic movements, again, pending any other comorbidities um, from a testing perspective, we can kind of use available um, standardized outcome measures um, in order to prescribe these exercises for patients. So tests like the mini best test, which kind of divide up um, different systems that are affecting balance can give you a good jumping off point for what to recommend. So you've done, you know, you do the mini best on someone, you realize that their primary deficit is in reactive balance, um, and then you develop a plan of care or, or an exercise plan based on that. And neuromotor training is recommended twice a week. So this is just an example of a high cardio re cardiorespiratory intensity protocol um, that encompasses all four of the domains. Um, the example here for aerobic um, would be calculating what their heart rate reserve is and targeting that 70% of heart rate reserve for 30 minutes, five times a week. Strengthening, um, particularly for frail elderly or individuals who have been inactive for a long time, you wanna first train the tendon. And what they mean by that is super, super lightweight, um, getting the tendon sort of conditioned because if in theory, if we hypertrophy a muscle too quickly without strengthening the tendon or training the tendon, um, people are more at risk for a tendinopathy or a tear. Um, so again, the strength training is recommended twice a week. 12 to 13 on the RPE scale for eight reps, two sets of all available muscle groups. Um, in theory, 70% of one at rep max, um, but for a lot of our patients, we won't calculate a one rep max. Um, and then we should reassess um, their one rep max, or you know, even if we do that sub-maximally uh, every two weeks for any strength gain so that we can progress the program. Flexibility exercises should be recommended daily. And then something, you know, some aspect of neuromotor training, whether it's Tai Chi, aquatic therapy, um, you know, even just walking in a pool um, one to two days per week. And all of this should be while monitoring heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturations, and RPE. So the goal is that this type of assessment um, and prescription is happening before they're discharged from skilled physical therapy. This should be sort of the focus of the last, you know, two to three weeks of their outpatient plan of care. Maybe not necessarily every session of each week. So if they're, you know, a person who gets seen three times a week, maybe you only focus on exercise prescription one out of those three days so that you're still working toward whatever goals that you have for them. Um, but really incorporating this, getting them comfortable with it, giving you time to assess their progress, reassess their progress before that they're discharged and reminding them that physical therapy is a dynamic process and that they can always come back. Um, if they feel like, you know, they need things to be harder, they need things to be easier, um, you know, getting a new script from their doctor or, you know, whatever it takes to kind of get them back in your, in your doors, even if it's just for, you know, quote unquote, tune up. The rationale for exercise and neurorehabilitation, I think some of this is pretty straightforward, but obviously improving cardiorespiratory fitness is a really big one. Reducing physical deconditioning, um, considering the increased energy demand for gait and ADLs when you're not, you know, quote unquote, physically fit. Um, this can kind of encourage people to participate more in physical activity and structured exercise. Um, reminding individuals that it, this can combat the progression toward frailty, um, you know, for a lot of people, particularly, you know, older adults who have their first stroke, you know, significantly later in life, um, a lot of times that stroke can be sort of a slippery slope to, you know, frailty, inactivity, all of that. So kind of reminding them and their family members and their caregivers that participating in regular physical activity is going to combat that progression. 
and then reducing their risk for non-communicable diseases or, or you know, reducing the impact of those non-communicable diseases if they already have them. So things like type two diabetes, obesity, hypertension, stroke, you know, subsequent stroke and cancer. And then obviously improving many other domains of health and wellness. So we see, you know, significant reductions in depression, anxiety. Um, we see improvements in cognition and sleep as well as just overall self-efficacy. So at the end of the day, we need to design comprehensive programs um, that promote reduction of risk for injury, both during and after exercise, help combat risk of developing overuse injuries just from performing ADLs. So making sure that we are, again, spending some time before they're discharged from skilled physical therapy, working on what this exercise program should look like, helping them incorporate a warm up that includes dynamic stretching, a prolonged cool down for flexibility training, um, and really, you know, letting them know and participate in the process of progressively increasing the volume and intensity of training. Um, and knowing that, you know, from a physical activity standpoint, patients may not tolerate or be able to address all four component areas of fitness, um, or they may need to exercise at a less intense level than suggested. But again, whatever they're doing is better than nothing. Um, and sort of, you know, keeping that framework and that mantra in mind for them. And then overall monitoring, you know, just their overall performance. I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about the new push in mostly inpatient rehab, as well as looking more chronically um, for quote unquote, high intensity training or high intensity gait training, kind of depending on where you are working. Um, and so Jenny Moore did a study uh, with her colleagues in 2010 that looked at sort of the component parts of a typical therapy session. Um, and what she found or what they found was that people tend to only spend, and by people, I mean, physical therapists around 34% of the session on gait training. So targeting probably around 800 steps per session, which I think particularly in my patients who are more low level, I, 800 is a stretch. I think for a lot of patients in, where I am in acute rehab, um, they spend roughly 11% of the time of each session on upper extremity exercise, 1% on transfers, 8% on stretching, 27% on active lower extremity exercises, 15% on balance and 4% on stairs. Um, and what we need to know, or what we already know about practice and performance is that at least from a neuroplasticity perspective, we need significant amounts of practice in order to improve in any given functional task. And anytime that we're dividing our time between all of these activities, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different components that we're trying to focus on in one treatment session. Um, so when we're dividing up our time, that reduces the amount of time that we spend practicing each individual task. So we don't get neuroplasticity and that's really no surprise. Um, so what we're looking at now is sort of this paradigm shift to high intensity gait training, where we're seeing multiple studies coming out that point to not only the feasibility and the efficacy of implementing high intensity gait training, um, but really on the levels of neuroplasticity, we're seeing actual changes in a person's individual gait outcomes afterwards. So why is intensity so important? Um, this intensity is really essential for walking recovery. Um, it increases oxygen delivery at aerobic capacity, which in turn leads to improved force generation. So they're seeing this carryover between improved cardiovascular fitness and actual improvements in strength. What I think is important to consider is that the definition of intensity can vary. Um, so for something like locomotor training, we're defining intensity as the amount of work per unit time. Um, whereas in sort of more upper extremity rehabilitation, something like constraint induced therapy, we're looking at more purely as the number of reps. And what's key with high intensity gait training and really high intensity training in general is that we need to switch up our variables. We need to change the amplitude of individuals movements. We need to change the speed that people are moving. We can add weight, we can add resistance, all of these things um, to really switch things up and consistently challenge the patient. So when we're talking about targeting intensity within the clinic, really the goal should be to achieve 60 to 80% of max heart rate during interventions. And while we're doing this, we want to maximize the number of steps that the patient takes prior to requiring a rest break. And I think that is actually one of the biggest shifts, particularly in the inpatient model of care. Um, I think we're very much inclined to 
offer too many rest breaks. And when we offer rest breaks, patients pretty much always take them. Um, but what we've been finding is that if we don't offer it, patients aren't asking. And from, you know, monitoring their vitals throughout a session, we're seeing that they don't actually need all of those rest breaks. Um, and I think it's one of those situations where particularly when you're supposed to be doing point of service documentation, we give rest breaks so that we can document. A lot of times it's not like, oh, you look so tired, you need a rest. It's, I have eight notes that I have to write. So let me get a little bit done while you take your rest break. Um, and that really minimizes the overall challenge that the patient is getting throughout each session. It minimizes the number of steps that they're able to take. Um, and it prevents us from really consistently challenging them. Um, Looking back as far as 2005, there has been research that showed that participants um, who participated in high intensity training um, had improvements in the six minute walk and the 10 meter walk uh, following this training compared to controls. But where the paradigm shift really started to happen was in 2016 when the VIEWS trial was published uh, by Dr. Hornby and his colleagues. Um, essentially, they looked at the efficacy of high intensity variable stepping training on walking. So they looked at things like gait speed. They did a six meter walk, a uh, six minute walk, excuse me. They looked at the average steps per day, their step symmetry, single limb stance abilities. Um, and then they also looked at non walking outcomes like the Berg, five times sit to stand, physical SF36, SF and the ABC, and compared it to conventional PT. So in the experimental group, all they did was walk at high intensity, 70 to 80% heart rate reserve in variable context. So they changed the surfaces, they changed the direction. Sometimes they resisted their walking, all sort of different um, variable parameters for walking. Whereas the control group um, basically just was supplemented with standardized conventional therapy. Um, so sort of when we looked at that Jenny Moore paper that looked at the division between gait training, stair training, balance training, traditional therapeutic exercise, all of that. Um, and the biggest difference between the experimental group and the control group is that the intensity in the control group was targeted at 30 to 40% of heart rate reserve versus the 70 to 80% in the experimental group. And what I think is also key here is when we lower the intensity, that's when therapists were really able to emphasize kinematics. Um, and I think that's sort of what's more traditionally taught educationally is that we work on normalizing gait kinematics and then we work on speed and then we work on distance and then we work on increasing the number of steps. But what this literature is showing is that if we just allow patients to walk and make, you know, allow them, invite them to feel safe walking um, against resistance at different speeds, the kinematics in a lot of situations normalize on their own without us directly focusing on them. So the results of this study showed that there was significant between group differences in walking speed, in walking distance, temporal gait symmetry, self-reported participation um, in the experimental group, whereas, but there was no significant difference in balance or sit-to-stand performance. Um, so sort of highlights some of the literature on transfer, reverse transfer, um, but even though there weren't significant differences between groups, there was significant differences within groups. Um, so both groups did get better um, at balance and sit to stand despite only practicing walking. So I wanna just show a clip, it's a couple minutes long, um, but it looks at a traditional high intensity gait training program in inpatient rehab and kind of what it looks like from beginning to end. Um, and from an implementation perspective, this is what's really going on in a lot of rehabs across the country now or participating in um, data collection for how feasible is this? What are the barriers to implementation of high intensity gait training? Um, and overall, you know, how do we overcome those barriers and really, you know, provide this across the board? Um, so just take a look. Nick had a stroke that um, made his left side weaker. So when he came in, his arm and his leg were both weak. He couldn't stand without a assist of um, one or two people. We did all of our walking in a harness system for safety. And I think Trent was behind him, like holding his shoulders, holding his trunk up. I had to really block out his knee, otherwise his knee would collapse. Uh, when we walked, his walking was really, really slow. It was really hard for Nick to process just like right, left, one foot in front of the other. And he, he needed help to get his legs forward. And then, like I said, if we didn't support him, his knee would just collapse when he walked. So, gosh, in the beginning, we would be lucky to make it down the hallway twice in an hour. I think it was actually your second day of therapy that we got on the treadmill. We didn't waste any time. Um, 
we took a little bit of weight off of him to make it easier. We did give him some um, support with his arms. For a long time, he had to use um, one arm on the treadmill. We started out pretty slow, 0.5 miles an hour. Um, we would bump him up to 1.0. He felt really uncomfortable with that. We were still helping him, of course, but his endurance improved, his strength got better. We're able to do some really fun stuff, really challenging things. I call it fun. What about turning all the way around and going backwards? The high intensity, we're really, we judge it on two things. We use what's called a Borg scale, so that judges his perceived exertion. We have it hung up all over here. It's on the wall. We carry them in our pocket. It's a 6 to 20 scale. The goal is to work between 14 and 17. So that's hard to very hard, and that's just how hard your heart and your lungs are working. The other way we measure it is he's got um, a little clip on his ear that's measuring his heart rate. So we want people to be working between 70 and 85% of their heart rate max. Um, physician cleared, of course, and you know we monitor those two things every single session the whole time. Everything with, with research right now is just saying whatever you do, do it at a high intensity. Do it in that 14 to 17. Get the heart rate up no matter, no matter what you're doing. Uh, and we're lucky on the stroke team to be working with a partner on this research study. So we have so many resources at our fingertips and we just know what's coming out of research right now and we're able to translate it into clinical practice fast. We're Mary Free, bud, for one thing. Get these two guys on your team and just do what they say. All of a sudden one day you, you get up and wow, now I know why she's making me go backward or sideways or it's a really neat process. When Nick had his stroke um, over a month ago and we were faced with choosing where to go, we said it's much too important. We depend on him so much that the place to go would be Mary Free Bed because we've only ever heard good things about it. Actually, his father had had a stroke and was here and was very, very happy and we're more than just tremendously happy with everything that's gone on here and the whole treatment team. Nick says he has the best team. I'm sure everybody says that, but I'm convinced that we did have the best team. She's really worked with him on speed and it's just amazing. And his gait today is just beyond belief. Like he had just a, I mean, it was getting the job done, but it wasn't very smooth. So. Oh, so much better today. You know, Nick has always had a great attitude, even from the start. I think he just focused on getting better and he's worked very, very hard, but you know, his treatment team has worked just as hard. So, um, and for sure, go to Mary Free Bed, say Mary, <laughs> ask for Mary, you know, and um, he was here, he was here. So, and we were so very grateful. Undescribable. They're, um, they're good people. Mm -hmm. I've watched this video dozens of times and it's still, you know, every day, you know, you're looking at a typical, you know, 17 to 21 day inpatient stay and seeing those gains happen so quickly and how much his gait mechanics normalize without actually focusing on the kinematics, just looking at that high intensity and getting him walking as much as possible. Last thing to kind of just talk about briefly is how medications interact with exercise. Um, this is just meant to serve as kind of a, a, a quick list, um, but looking at how medications that are specifically for cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease may affect the way that an individual exercises or a way that they tolerate exercise. So for individuals with hypertension, if they're on ACE inhibitors, this may cause a chronic dry cough. Um, it can cause persistent orthostasis um, if the dosage isn't correct with beta blockers, we see that sort of blunted heart rate response during exercise. So they may not be able to achieve that 70 to 85% of heart rate max. But when we use a Borg scale with them, as long as they're between that 14 to 17, we know that we're targeting the right things. If the individual's on diuretics, they're at risk for electrolyte imbalances, which might cause muscle cramps, potential arrhythmias, dehydration, um, orthostasis, um, they're associated with falls as well. We might also see increased heart rate with activity sort of above what we would expect from a traditional exercise response. If they're on a statin, um, which is a lipid lowering drug, we may see fatigue, weakness, leg pain. A lot of statins are associated with uh, a chronic tendinopathy. So something to be aware of. 
if they've on top of their stroke also had any sort of myocardial ischemia, they may be again on beta blockers. They may be on a cardiotonic like digoxin. Um, so just kind of being aware of what the signs of digoxin toxicity are being aware that these individuals might have EKG changes both at rest and during exercise. Um, patients with both strokes and myocardial ischemia might be on chronic anticoagulation therapy. So we just have to be aware of bleeding or bruising. If the individual also has dysrhythmic heart disease, something like AFib or chronic tachycardia, if they're on any sort of antiarrhythmic medication, this can be associated with GI distress, which is going to decrease, you know, a person's ability to participate in exercise as well as their willingness to participate. Um, also possibly associated with headache and dizziness. If they're on any sort of antiplatelet medication, particularly for individuals with, with atrial fibrillation, they're almost always on an anticoagulant. We just have to be worried about bleeding. Um, a lot of our patients are on antidepressants as a result of sort of that reactive depression that can happen post stroke. So things like sedation and lethargy, the not necessarily true muscle weakness, but perceived muscle weakness is a side effect, orthostasis falls as well as arrhythmias. And then another thing to be definitely aware of is if they're using any sort of transdermal uh, patches for anything, even, you know, a pain patch and nitroglycerin for chest pain, um, a nicotine patch for smoking cessation. Um, there may be the risk of orthostasis and arrhythmias as well as increased uptake of the drug during exercise because more blood flow is going to the skin. General exercise precautions for individuals post-stroke. We have to be aware of any cardiovascular precautions that they may have, again, because a stroke doesn't just affect the brain. It is a cardiovascular problem. Being aware of any medications that they're on and just the impact of polypharmacy in general. So polypharmacy is considered being on any more three or more medications at any given time. We have to consider what assisted devices they need to safely exercise, what is their fall risk, so that we can help them make safe choices. What other comorbidities do they have? So I mentioned before things like osteoarthritis, um, chronic diabetes, where they may have some sort of retinopathy is also an issue, any pre-existing orthopedic issues as well. And then to wrap up, just keeping in mind that stroke is more than just a brain issue. Um, and a lot of what we're doing in regardless, you know, whatever setting we work in is encouraging patients to have a lifelong buy-in to physical activity. Um, educating them that physical activity enhances quality of life in everyone, not just individuals post-stroke. Um, and then really the key is meeting them where they are um, and practicing shared decision-making with them and really trying to get at what they can work on in the immediate, you know, next couple of weeks in order to enhance their quality of life. And then finally, what we're finding, you know, is the most helpful is intensity. And these are just some additional references and that's it. Thank you, Ariel, for such a thorough look at the state of physical activity and health and how we can think about improving this on a mass level in those with disability. Um, I really loved how you highlighted the role that we as physical therapists can play not only as mobility experts, but as people who can help maximize patients' overall health and wellness by anticipating rather than reacting to health and wellness needs. Um, you introduced a lot of great concepts, so I have just a few follow-up questions for you. Sure. Um, first one, you talked about closing the gap between activity recommendations and patient behaviors by setting value-based quality of life goals. How do you work with getting that buy-in from patients maybe who have cognitive or communication deficits after stroke or other neurologic impairment? That definitely does make it more challenging when you add that layer in. Um, what I think is really interesting is the concept of motivational interviewing, um, and what they recommend within motivational interviewing is really active listening um, and sort of enabling both the interviewer and the interviewee to actively reflect on what it is that's happening to make that shared decision. So what is most helpful for individuals that have a cognitive or communication deficit is bringing in a caregiver or a family member um, to sort of help fill in the gaps that that person might not be able to fill in for us. So what activities were enjoyable beforehand? You know, maybe they enjoyed riding an actual bike, which might not be safe for them right now, but a recumbent bike might be a really good substitute for that, even temporarily as a bridge to getting back to riding an actual bike. Um, so really trying to tap into whatever available resources the patient has from a family standpoint, a caregiver standpoint, a friend standpoint, um, what were they into socially that may have contributed to 
them being physically active. So maybe their only physical activity before was commuting to work. Maybe they walked, you know, three or four blocks to work every day. And now because of their cognitive or communication deficit, they're unable to work. So it took away the only physical activity that they were participating in before. So having that sort of advanced knowledge can really help with that exercise prescription piece. And then with the buy-in and the follow-up after that as well. That's awesome. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, so the other thing I was thinking was, you know, as more and more clinicians become aware of really the necessity to be training our neurologic patients in that high intensity range, what do you recommend to help clinicians feel confident that they are safely implementing this recommendation in different clinical settings? It's been a really big challenge um, implementing it on the inpatient side of things. And I think it's not even just so much from a, a PT buy-in. It is all of the oversight that happens medically. Um, and I think this happens in outpatient as well. So helping other healthcare providers understand not only the benefit of it, but the safety of it. Um, there's a lot of crosstalk back and forth about whether you need a physician order to begin high intensity training, um, because technically it's still gate training, which is within our scope of practice. Um, and so a lot of education has happened, at least on our end, for educating the medical team um, to what the literature is saying about the safety of getting a person's heart rate up that high post-stroke. We talk a lot about things like permissive hypertension in individuals post ischemic stroke, at least, and, you know, sort of allowing their systolic blood pressure and even their diastolic blood pressure to kind of get up there. But we haven't talked much about heart rate in the past. Um, so I think, you know, we're, you know, talking to physicians about like, Hey, do you mind if I get this patient who just had a stroke at their heart rate, you know, in the, like the one sixties, they're like, what? Um, and I think as therapists too, initially it was kind of scary. I'm like, you want me to work my patient? How hard, um, you know, until I saw it in action and saw it work, I think that really, that example is the best way to get the buy-in. And when you watch clips like that, where you saw, you know, in a 21 day length of stay, not only did this guy become an independent ambulator, but his gait mechanics looked pretty darn normal. Couldn't necessarily tell that he had a stroke. You could tell, you know, if you are a PT and you're, you know, have a trained eye and you're looking at his gait, you're like, eh, he's got some decreased arm swing. Um, but his gait mechanics improved to a point where he didn't need uh, an assisted device. He didn't need a, an AFO. Um, and all thanks to them just walking. They didn't focus on heel strike. They didn't focus on, you know, sort of all the pre-gate weight shifting, uh, weight acceptance things that we were traditionally taught in school. So I think it is an entirely new way of thinking. And I think it's never going to be appropriate for a hundred percent of patients. And I think we realize that, um, but realizing that it's not only just an option, but that there are probably more patients who are appropriate for it then are not appropriate for it. Mm -hmm. And really just utilizing any technology that you have available to you. So we're using polar heart rate monitors um, with an armband um, connected to either an iPad or our own phone so that we're carrying it with us as we're doing this gait training. And so we have real time measures of their heart rate. We're constantly talking about the Borg scale for our individuals who are, you know, cognitively impaired or who have communication deficits. We're going more by, you know, facial expressions. Are they, you know, extremely diaphoretic and they weren't two minutes ago? Um, are they breathing really heavy? Um, so just kind of feeling confident as, a PT to say like, I got this and knowing that, you know, it does require more manpower. So we try to, you know, set up these sessions as co-treats as often as we can so that there is that second pair of hands to really be able to push the patient from a balanced perspective too. Love it. Well, Ariel, thank you so much for your time and this excellent talk. You know, it really is such an important, but to this point often overlooked topic. And so I really think this will serve as such a great resource for the field going forward. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. And to our viewers, please be sure to like and subscribe using the buttons below and also reach out in the comments with any thoughts or questions that arose while Ariel worked through this important topic. You know, it's so important that as a field, we all work together to get on the same page with utilizing aerobic exercise prescription to help our neurologic patients meet their health and wellness goals. So feel free to reach out with any issues that you feel you have, you know, instituting these recommendations into your own clinical practice and we can get a conversation going. Um, so with that, we'll say we'll sign off and hope you tune in again with us next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much.